Welcome everyone. This is the latest in a series of webinars exploring different aspects of what might be described as the design hypothesis and whether it's a satisfactory explanation of ultimate reality. During the past two years, we've hosted many influential thinkers, scientists and philosophers covering a range of topics from virology to the origin of the universe. And you can find these on the C4ID website. Links to the YouTube channel are also there and you're currently watching this channel, of course. Make sure that you like and subscribe to be kept in the loop. I'll say a little about next month's webinar as we wind up this session in due course. Today, I'm really delighted that we've been joined by Professor John Lennox. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. John has some really interesting ideas to share, and I'm sure this will be a stimulating and memorable interaction. John is the Professor of Mathematics Emeritus at Oxford University, an internationally renowned speaker and an author of several books on the interface of science, philosophy and religion. He grew up and studied at the Royal School in Armagh, Northern Ireland, and then at Emmanuel College and Cambridge University, from which he took his MA, then M Math and PhD, and he worked for some years thereafter in the Mathematics Institute at the University of Wales in Cardiff, where he was awarded the DSC for his research. Now, for most normal mortals, that might be enough. However, he also holds an MA and a DPhil from Oxford University and an MA in bioethics from the University of Surrey. He's lectured extensively in North America, Eastern and Western Europe and Australasia on mathematics, on the philosophy of science and the intellectual defense of Christianity. And incidentally, some of these lectures he's delivered in German or Russian, quite a track record. And he's famously debated famous advocates of naturalism and atheism, including Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, and Peter Singer. John's written output is just prolific. Apart from a couple of research level textbooks on algebra, he's written a number of books on the interface between science, philosophy, and theology. During lockdown, it looks as though John's output has changed up a gear or two. There has been a little book, Where is God in a Coronavirus World? He's written, Can Science Explain Everything? Uh, another one, 2084 on Artificial Intelligence. And his latest book, which I hope we'll focus on today, is called Cosmic Chemistry. You can visit his website for more detail. It's johnlennox.org. Hopefully you'll be able to put some questions that occur to you in the YouTube chat and we'll try and pick up as many as we can in the time available. John, what a pleasure to welcome you today. Thank you so much for coming on for this conversation. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm absolutely delighted to, to be with you and I'm looking forward to the discussion. John, there have been so many projects recently, science faith related projects, uh, film production projects against the tide, uh, various podcasts, numerous interviews and lectures. Give us a bit of an idea of the kind of things that you try to fit into your day. Well, today, for instance, I was in Oxford doing a film for a Swiss studio and they are producing a, a documentary and the, one of the big topics for the documentary is how do various religions cope with the problem of suffering so i was discussing the coronavirus uh, and various things like that but typical days I, i'm mostly at home i'm of an age now where i'm very careful of covid but i'm very happy to be uh, in this situation because I can get a great deal of writing done, whereas in, in former days uh, I did a lot of traveling. So most of my time, I think, is on working on various projects in different directions. I tend to work on two or three at once, which is why my output in the past couple of years has been significantly more, I suppose than it was in earlier times where I was traveling the world and doing lectures and things. So I, I'm glad of a respite, David, to be honest. Yeah. John, a, a new foray for you has been not quite into the sort of Hollywood scene, but you had this very significant movie made principally about your life and your approach to 
some of the big issues, some of which we'll talk about this evening. Against the Tide, tell us a little bit about that and any developments that have been going on there. Well, that was the result of a very interesting idea by an American physicist who's a, an entrepreneur who had read one of my books and he called me in Oxford because he was having some research done in the university. And uh, we immediately hit it off and I, he was very concerned about getting the message out about the fact that there is a much more logical alternative to materialism or, or naturalism. And he had the idea of doing a film on it. Now, the backstory to that is there was a film that grossed quite a lot in the box office in America called God's Not Dead. And in it, there was an atheist uh, philosophy teacher who was challenged by a student uh, talking about Stephen Hawking and so on. And I was in this physicist's home and saw this film. And to my utter amazement, in the film, the student was using my arguments and quoting me. That was the first I'd ever heard of it. They didn't hadn't consulted me, actually. But uh, at the heels of uh, the hunt, the idea was to meet the atheist actor who actually is a Christian and very interested in these things, Kevin Sorbo, who's very well known. And we hit it off. And so uh, there developed an idea of a film starting in Oxford and moving to Israel in two parts to deal, first of all, with the God and science question. Does science give us any indicators that there may be an intelligence an intelligent mind behind the universe. And then the second question is, if that is the case, as I believe it is, how do we get to know who uh, that intelligent mind is? In other words, what God are we talking about? And because I'm a convinced Christian and believe that God is the God of creation as revealed in the Bible, uh, I took him to Israel and we went on there to discuss the specific historical and existential evidence for the truth of Christianity. And this became the film Against the Tide. And people who are interested in it can look up againstthetidemovie.com and they'll see a trailer because it's now available in eight languages, dubbed on DVD, Blu-ray and, and for live streaming. And I'm encouraged to see that there's been great interest in it. And it's suitable for people who want to think these things through. It doesn't make up their minds for them, but it tries to present the evidence. John, let me just ask you a little bit about some of the interactions you've had. I mean, I, I mentioned earlier that you've debated sort of high profile atheist thinkers like Christopher Hitchens and Dawkins and, and Peter Singer. When, when you approach these events, do you have a kind of a game plan in the back of your mind? I mean, are there certain key messages you want to try and articulate? Uh, how do you kind of tactically deal or prepare for really kind of, I suppose, high stakes events like that in terms of the realm of ideas? Well, there is a sense, although I didn't know it at the time, that my whole life has been a preparation for it because uh, you mentioned that I speak one or two languages. And uh, one of the things that has interested me since boyhood, actually, is to understand the polar opposite of my Christian position, in other words, the atheist position. And I don't know what it's like to be an adult and a non-believer. So C.S. Lewis helped me a great deal there, uh, talking about his own conversion to Christianity and his subsequent intellectual defense of Christianity. But my interest in atheism, I suppose, was part of the reason why I jumped at an opportunity to do mathematical research in Germany. That gave me the language. And very soon I was traveling into East Germany and to Hungary and Poland and did that frequently during the Cold War. So I came up against the outworking of atheism in society. And then when the wall fell, because I was had been for some years a professional translator of mathematical Russian, I was able to get entree to travel to Russia 
And uh, there I was facing uh, academics, mainly in the first instance, who'd been subject to atheistic philosophy for 75 years, much longer than these Germans. And all of that unknown to me, I think was a real training to face the likes of Dawkins and Hitchens uh, with their strong atheism, but uh, men who I fear have no clue as to how atheism actually works out in a society. Now, you mentioned, did I have a game plan? <laughs> and in a sense, yes. I took some advice from a very brilliant a newspaper reporter who's very well known in this country. He was visiting our college and I, I said, do you have any advice for me debating Hitchens? It was in this case, who was a journalist himself. And he said, well, don't try to outwit him, but make sure that whatever is said, that you get stating your own message what you want to get across to the people who are watching the debate. In other words, don't let your opponent in the debate set the agenda. Now, that was very wise adv advice. Uh, and so uh, there is that sense, and perhaps I can illustrate it most easily by what happened with my first debate with Tolkien's. I'd never met him before, even though we're in the same University of Oxford. And as we walked in to the absolutely packed auditorium in Birmingham, Alabama, he said to me, you know, I don't debate. Well, I said, I, I don't debate either. I've never done anything like this. But if it's any consolation to you, what I intend to do tonight is to try to show people that there is a logical and uh, rational alternative to your atheism. And he said, I'll buy that. And off we went in. So there's that sense in which I know that although there are famous conversions like that of Saul of Tarsus, I don't fool myself. These are formidable opponents. But what I want to do is to show people that there is an alternative to what they are representing. And I want to do it in the spirit of you make up your own mind. I'm not going to try and browbeat Dawkins or anybody else. I want to present the evidence for the truth of what I believe and do it in a respectful way. So I take their arguments very seriously. And uh, part of my preparation is reading as far as possible everything they write and trying to understand it because I want to be fair to these people. John, let me, let me just turn, if I may, to your latest book, this Cosmic Chemistry a book, which I think is a follow-on to a previous book, God's Undertaker, Has Science Buried God? And I think if I'm right in saying this, the main contention of, of this new book is that science has not buried God, but rather theology and science join together in a kind of conjunctive explanation that has more explanatory power than either on its own. What about the idea that science ought to give us good enough evidence to point to God if God exists? And what is a soft subject? You're a hard subject guy, a mathematician. What does a soft subject like theology actually bring to the table? Well, I'm not so sure that theology is a soft subject <laughs> in the sense that you're sitting there in Scotland and I would be surprised to hear a Scot who has knowledge of the intellectual history of the Scottish divides uh, thinking theology is a soft subject. The people who founded Oxford University were keen on theology and on mathematics and, and the other basic sciences because both of those things were actually under the the mantle of of rational thought. They felt that rational thought belonged in the university and theology belonged there. I know that Dawkins thinks that it doesn't. But um, I wrote my book to point out that, yes, science is not actually neutral. It does point towards the existence uh, of a god. And that's what you would expect. The original meaning of the word science from the Latin scientia is, is knowledge. Uh, and of course, in English now, the word science tends to refer to the natural sciences. So we're looking at uh, 
what we call the natural world. But that begs a question, is there a supernature that created it? Because if there is, it's a supernatural world as, as well. And we could go into that, of course. But my basic contention is that the notion that science and God are opposed is easily demonstrably false. And that's the first important step. Now, you've got a very famous physicist called Peter Higgs in Scotland, who, who won the Nobel Prize, and rightly so, for predicting the discovery of a particle called the Higgs boson. Now, Peter Higgs is an atheist, um, but he does believe that he takes people seriously who, who think that there is a God. So he's won the Nobel Prize in physics. Now, Bill Phillips from the United States won the same prize a few years before that. And here are two physicists, both won the Nobel Prize, so they're, they're at the top, but Bill Phillips is a Christian. And it seems to me that that's enough to show that the idea that science and God are essentially opposed must be false. You couldn't have two Nobel Prize winners, both at the top of physics, but they've different worldviews. And I think we will get nowhere in the discussion. And this is one of the major initial contentions in my book. Until we realize that the conflict is not between science and God or science and theology, but it's between the worldviews of atheism and theism. And there are brilliant scientists on both sides. Yeah. So that the real question is your question. Does science itself, the natural sciences, do they point towards a creator, towards an intelligent mind behind the universe, or do they point, as Dawkins and others would claim, towards atheism? Mm -hmm. That is where the debate ought to be focused. Yeah, yeah. Do you think it's, do you think it's just the case that the science world has kind of become conditioned to be antagonistic towards anything supernatural because it kind of falls outside their standard way of thinking methodologically i think that's partly true but i'm not sure that the grounds for the perceived opposition i, I think it's actually a myth but the grounds for the perceived opposition are very complex historically because at the time of darwin and his famous contention with uh, Bishop Wilberforce. Mm -hmm. Huxley, uh, who was the driving force, he, he was interested in getting rid of these so-called amateur scientists like Wilberforce, who was a bishop, but Wilberforce was actually brilliant. Darwin made the point that he'd uncommonly brilliantly discovered all the weaknesses in Darwin's argument. Huxley wanted to abolish churches and install um, some kind of throne to the goddess Sophia in them. So the, there was a cultural movement which was anti-God in principle. And it seemed to me that that preceded the science. It's one of the best ways I think of illustrating it is coming much more up to date and taking uh, the famous geneticist Richard Lewontin uh, of Harvard and he very openly and honestly, and I, I feel also bravely on one occasion wrote that the methods of science do not compel us to accept materialistic solutions. No, but what does? Our a priori, that is our preconceived commitment to atheism, to a materialistic view of the universe. And he went on very surprisingly and quite amazingly to say, we cannot allow a divine foot in the door, I suppose, because they were afraid of what might be attached to a divine foot, a divine mind and all the rest of it. But that shows me that there's a real deep existential problem here of the relationship of science and scientific thinking, that is in the natural sciences, and the preconceived philosophical underpinning, which in most areas of science is completely irrelevant. When you're studying biology and wondering what this piece is for, mm -hmm. 
uh, the theological dimension just doesn't appear. But if you're asking questions about ultimate origin or the question of meaning, then of course it does appear. And I think one of the problems is that science, the natural sciences have been wonderfully successful and we're all grateful to them and for the technological spin-offs so that people have become convinced and there's a lot of drivers of this conviction that science can explain everything. That's what we call scientism. When the really great scientists have seen that that cannot be true. And Peter Medawar is one of the most famous of them. And he wrote a wonderful little book, um, Advice to a Young Scientist, where he said in it, it's, it's so obvious that science cannot answer every question. It cannot handle the, the simplest questions of a child, where do I come from? Where am I going? And what is the meaning of my life? And he said it's to philosophy and religion and so on that we must turn for answers to those questions. So I think the thing we need to realize is that science is wonderful, but it's limited by the very nature of the kinds of question it asks. And if like Lewontin, you confine yourself initially to purely naturalistic answers by asking purely naturalistic questions, then you cannot say a word as to whether there exists a God or not because you've excluded him by definition. But that is not what I conceive of as the true spirit of intellectual inquiry, which is following the evidence where it leads. Yeah. Isn't it interesting that, and if, I suppose you might ask the question of why it is that some people like these big name scientists, and I know you've interacted with more than the ones that we've mentioned already, and I suppose the, the scientific mind of someone like Peter Atkins maybe comes to the fore, but I wonder why those individuals like to present themselves as being rational and tolerant and seeking the truth and keen to follow the evidence and yet remain vehemently opposed to any kind of theistic suggestion, even if the evidence seems to point in that direction. Why do you think that is? It's very difficult, I find, to suss out people's motivation, because perhaps this is an area where it's very difficult to be honest. Now, it was, I think, one of the Huxleys who said the sheer joy that when he discovered that it was okay to be an atheist, he could go and behave as immorally as he wanted to behave. That there may well be moral grounds. And from a biblical perspective and a Christian perspective, I, I think it's important to factor that in, that in the human heart, there does appear to be a very strong tendency to rebel against God because we do not like anybody in control of our lives and of course that is one of the next questions that has to be asked if there is a god what is my relationship to him there's that and sometimes the bitterness and the hardness among scientists comes and i'm going now to the other side from a very negative experience of contact with professing Christians. Mm -hmm. And they've been turned completely off by, by what they see. Mm -hmm. But then I think there's a fear element because if you've been doing science, particularly if you've been doing it successfully for many years and somebody comes along with pretty powerful arguments, undermining your philosophical presuppositions, it's very hard to stand back and say, well, could this person be right? Because it opens up a huge black hole uh, underneath. I'll never forget uh, having an interview with Anthony Flew, the, the famous philosopher who was a great, one of the greatest defenders of, of David Hume's uh, alleged atheism in his heyday, certainly David Hume's arguments if you could call them that, and I'm afraid I'm being slightly cynical here, against uh, miracles. And Anthony Flew, when I interviewed him, he was an elderly man, and he told me he, he had been the Richard Dawkins of his day, really. But he said he'd come to see that, and here's a very interesting thing, 
he had taken the evidence of the linguistic structure of DNA, that here is a language coded into biology and uh, the longest word we've ever discovered written in four chemical letters, the human genome. And he had come to the conclusion, looking at that, that there must be an intelligence behind it. And that had reversed his opinions. And I said to him quite directly, I said, so what about David Hume? He said, I was wrong about David Hume. I was wrong. And he said, I'm sorry to say, he said, that my books would have to be rewritten. And I'm too old to do that. Now, interestingly enough, Antony flew on the basis of that kind of design argument. He, he perceived intelligence in the DNA, uh, became a deist, but he believed that there's some sort of God out there. And he invited his friend, Tom Wright, which is a very interesting thing, to co-write the book with him and give evidence for the truth of Christianity. So that was a very honest reversal, but that kind of thing in science is very rare. And in philosophy, it's probably even rarer. I think it's, it's simply the case that in, in your book, Cosmic Chemistry, you very clearly would argue against the kind of reductionist idea that everything can be kind of broken down to yes you know, maybe to physiology from life and then down to biochemistry and then chemistry and then physics and so on. And, and you've just, you just articulated the way in which Anthony Flew kind of reversed his thinking on that. What, what for you is the strongest reason that would be a defeater for materialism? Would it be, would it be the idea of code? Would it be information in biology? Or would well, it, it would mind? effectively, but it's simpler than that. It would be that we can do science in the first place, that we can reason. Uh, the human mind is the vastly important thing. We can reason, we can understand information, we can use information. And of course, DNA, and the, the genetic code is only part of it. Mathematics is another part of it. The mathematical the describability of the universe. That is an absolutely remarkable thing. And it takes you to be as clever as Einstein or Eugene Wigner to recognize that there's something here to be understood. Uh, Einstein once said the only incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. And why it's a, a very powerful argument comes from assuming uh, the opposite. And uh, I often discuss with colleagues just to see what, what happens. I, I ask them, the scientists that is, what they do science with. And they usually say, well, you know, with my, well, most of them would like to say mine, but many of them don't believe that there's a mind separate from the brain. So they say with my brain, I say, okay, I don't agree with the uh, colliding or putting the two uh, as the same thing, but I'll go along with you you do science with your brain yes now give me a brief history of the brain and you'll get something like well the brain is the end product of a mindless unguided process and i just look at them and i say and you trust it and i let that sink in for a little bit yes i do trust it but what grounds have you for trusting it and then i say this suppose you knew that the computer you use every day in your laboratory was the end product of a mindless unguided process would you use it now here's the interesting thing i've spoken to some of the world's top scientists and put this to them and every single one has said no i would not use it well i said you've got a problem then you've got a real problem and Lewis put his finger on it years ago when he said, roughly speaking, something like this, any theory that invalidates human thought cannot be true because you reach it by thinking or by reason, you see. And so my main argument, uh, and I feel it is very strong indeed, is that if you try to reduce uh, the mind, so to speak, to the brain, in other words, abstract mental thought mathematics to physics and chemistry 
then you absolutely destroy any possibility of meaning. Now, I was taught quantum physics many years ago by Professor Sir John Polkinghorne, and he uh, talked, talks a great deal in his book about the problem of reducing thought to the firing of synapses. And he, he says, none of us believe that that is true because it destroys any possibility of reason. It's not that it simply gets rid of God, it does that by definition, but it gets rid of science. Mm -hmm. And I, for one, would be very <laughs> reluctant to accept uh, an argument that actually gets rid of science and any rational thought whatsoever. And I think that's an important argument. Why? Not simply because people like C.S. Lewis, who are avowedly Christian, or Alvin Plantinga, who has updated it. But what is most interesting to me in the contemporary world, you've got a very brilliant American philosopher, Thomas Nagel, and he sees the point of it. He sees it very clearly. And he's a hard atheist. Uh, what I mean by that is he doesn't want there to be a God, and he says so. Yeah. But he says there's a real problem with evolutionary naturalism because it teaches us not to believe uh, the, uh, that our thinking is valid. And he says that cannot be true. Now, he is desperately looking for a naturalistic solution. I'm not convinced he's going to find one. Well, it almost seems like a contradiction in terms, doesn't it? I mean, I've read his book, Mind and Cosmos, where he, yes. he kind of destroys the, the kind of reductionist naturalism. And in, indeed, with it, he kind of makes the claim that the conventional Darwinian style approach to evolution just doesn't stack up. But he seems to be, he seems to be accepting some kind of design, some kind of teleology, but seems to want to have a a natural teleology, a design without a designer. And that seems to me to be almost a contradiction in terms. I think it is a contradiction in terms. Uh, it becomes nonsens nonsensical. Yeah. And one of the very interesting questions I ask myself is, why do such people go to such lengths when they're brilliant and they can see the argument? Why do they not follow their argument to its logical conclusion? Yeah, and an old Irish farmer, you know, once taught me a very interesting thing. He said, if a man cannot see reason, then reason is not his problem. Yeah. And that's something worth thinking about. There's there's something else going on. Yes, yes. Yeah, I suspect you're right. And I'm sure that's almost certainly behind the kind of attitude of the late Richard Lewinton and others like Atkinson. I, 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 I fear so, although one mustn't, I don't know their inner story, you know. I can only see, read what they, they write. John, let me let me just um, open up another area, really just to, to think about your, when I mean, you've got a great skill in engaging people in conversation and, and seeing the arguments. And I think the one thing that's impressed me time and time again, and you've done it many times, is that you've often taken the claims of people who would be skeptical of your position. And you've turned the tables on the discussion by applying exactly the standards that they demand of you to their own claims. So for example, you did it with, with the fact that Dawkins tried to belittle your idea that there was a creator God who created God. And you turned that around so nicely by asking him, well, you believe the universe created you, who created your creator? Yes. And Singer, you used, you know, Singer used the genetic fallacy just by by claiming that you had the views you had because of your, your upbringing. And you turned that on him and pointed out that he had the views he had, perhaps because of his upbringing. So, so tell us a little bit about, I mean, is that is that a ploy that you've got and you're looking for these kind of opportunities? Or what other tips do you have for engaging in discussion with, with skeptics? Well, actually, that that's a very simple thing. It's it's here's an argument that's being used does it really do what it claims to do or is it a two-edged sword is the person using it unaware that it's cutting at their own position and i spend a, a lot of time thinking about that because if you're convinced as i am that there is a god and that there is such a, a thing as truth, then arguments that that claim to knock God down, so to speak, 
I've often found, and of course, Lewis does this, I can't think of a specific case, but other authors do this. But one of the most interesting examples is the whole Freudian notion of um, the idea that God is a delusion. Richard Dawkins wrote a, a book on this. And uh, Freud's explanation of religion as being a delusion, a, a wish for a father figure of the sky and all this kind of thing. And there's a wonderful German psychiatrist called Manfred Lutz who's written a book called A Brief History of the Great One, that is of God, that he's, he's very witty. But in it, he says, you know, if God does not exist, Freud's argument for religion being, being delusory is watertight and it works brilliantly, you see. But of course, he said, if, if God is really there, the very same argument tells you that atheism is the delusion. Atheism, uh, the desire not to meet with God or be accountable to him, it works exactly both ways. And then he uh, delivers his killer stroke. He says, therefore, since it works both ways, you cannot use Freud's argument to disprove the existence of God. He doesn't even discuss it. Mm -hmm. Whether there is a God or not, Freud won't help you, neither will Jung or Frankel or any of these other people. And I'm constantly looking for arguments like that. Now, why do I do that? Because Christ himself uses the arguments like that. You know, where, where people said he was of the devil. Well, if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, who's a devilish prince, by whom do your sons do it? It was a logical contradiction. Uh, and therefore, using people's arguments against themselves, I feel I've got a good biblical warrant to do that and a logical warrant because these arguments are arguments that are being spread in literature all over the world. The, the, the one you mentioned, who, who created the creator, and that is put forward as if it uh, ended all discussion when it's childish and it needs to be shown up to be childish by using it against the people that use it. John, there's another another area in your book. Let's get away from the reductionism side of things, but I, I was intrigued by uh, an area that at least some materialist scientists would perhaps appeal to, and they appeal to it, you know, for the information carrying properties of DNA, that somehow the information just kind of emerged. But let's just think about a different area that you've been interested in. What about consciousness. You know, there, though we mentioned the mind-brain issue a little bit earlier on. This notion that consciousness is just somehow an emergent property, somehow it emerges. No idea of an, a mechanism, just an assertion. It just is assumed. What do you make of that? Is it an emergent property? Well, I don't make very much of it, actually, because my first question is, what do you mean by emergent? <laughs> Many years ago, it brings to mind the lecture that Dawkins gave. It was the first one of his I ever heard, where he was talking about this very thing and, and saying that he wasn't talking about consciousness. He was talking about uh, information emerging, you see. and. Um, I put up my hand at the end to ask a question. I said, can you give me uh, an illustration of an emergent property? Oh, he said, yes. The word processing capacity of uh, a computer. They were pretty simple in those days. And I thought, well, if ever there was an example to refute your position against the idea of a designer, that's it. And if you say it emerges, I want to say, how does it emerge? You see, does it emerge simply by putting two things together? Hydrogen and oxygen gives you water, or does it need a catalyst? Or does it emerge like his property did by giving a very powerful intelligent input in terms of masses of software? Mm -hmm. uh, do you have to have an intelligent input for this? And so emergence uh, becomes a word that is used to plaster over the cracks in, in people's thinking. And you've got to ask emerges 
how. Now, the idea that consciousness emerges has no evidence for it whatsoever, except the argument that people use is that we are conscious, so it must have happened somehow. And because they assume a naturalistic worldview, that it must have happened uh, because of the basically mindless forces of nature plus the laws of nature, although they often don't raise the question where those come from. And that's an example of something extremely important. I mentioned earlier the scientific presuppositions of a Lewinton, but I think one of the very important things that is worth being aware of is these ideas that consciousness uh, emerges or that various biological organisms evolve in some way or another. It sounds extremely impressive, but until you have a mechanism, you're, you're simply using a word which is content free. You don't actually know what you are talking about. And unless you have evidence of how that happens, now it is not enough to present as evidence your worldview convictions. Oh, it's got to have happened because we are in a, a, a universe that is a closed system of cause and effect. So it must have happened that way. Well, how do you know we're in a universe that's a closed system? Yeah. I will agree with you that if that's all we've got, then it must have happened that way. But how will you prove that the universe is a closed system of cause and effect? I think the evidence is that it isn't. It's an open system created by an intelligent creator who can feed as he wills uh, new events and new information into the system just as scientists do when they are doing experiments mm -hmm. they take materials and they use their intelligence and they build intelligence into the system so i am very leery myself and that's one of the big questions i ask is is this coming from your worldview or is it coming from scientific investigation? Yeah. And very often it's coming from the worldview because they cannot conceive that there is any rational alternative. Yeah. So they prefer the irrational explanation. As I mentioned, the reductionist one. Yeah. So in fact, what they're doing is they're almost using that same rhetorical trick. I mean, they're using a kind of naturalism of the gaps. Oh, ab ab yeah. Absolutely. The concept of evolution, naturalism, materialism, emergence of the gaps uh, <laughs> uh, outstrips the notion of God of the gaps by, by a long way. Not that I approve of God of the gaps, but that's a different matter. Yes, yes. John, there's a couple of areas. I, I mean, I, our time is going to be running short, and for some reason we're having difficulty with the YouTube chat, but I've got a couple of other areas that I just want to, to explore with you, which you mention in your book. And one of the figures that comes out, and clearly an individual for whom you have a great deal of respect, is the well-known physicist Paul Davis. Yes. Paul Davis has written a lot about the sort of fine-tuning fine -tuning parameters in, in the natural world. And I just wanted to ask you how convinced you were about some of these arguments. I mean, how convincing, for example, are the notions that relate to the ratio of the various forces, you know, the nuclear strong force to the electromagnetic force, for example, or, or to the gravitational force constant. I mean, there, there just seems to be this agreement that there is such an, in, an, an exquisite degree of finely tuned, balanced integration there. How, how kind of testable or secure do you think these statements are? Well, I'm not a particle physicist, nor am I a physicist but I read as much about it as I can. And I, I think one of the important things about the fine tuning argument is that the vast majority of physicists are utterly convinced of it. Not only so, but they are convinced it demands an explanation. And the late Stephen Hawking was one of those. And uh, he, uh, like Lord Rees, our astronomer royal, he's also one of them. Uh, he wrote a book about it called Just Six Numbers, and he's amazed at the fine tuning. And his response to it is to say, well, some people prefer uh, or at least believe in the old view, 
which reminds me of C.S. Lewis warning against chronological snobbery. If it's old, it must be false. The old view that there's a God who did it in the first place. And then he says, I prefer to think that and then he goes to the many worlds of the multiverse hypothesis to account for it. He feels a driving need to account for it. And so does Davis and so does Hawking and so do virtually all scientists. And the one or two, like the late Victor Stenger, who took a different view, have been discredited. I think Luke Barnes, the Australian physicist, has written by far probably the best analysis of fine tuning and dealt with its objectors in a very profound way. Let me illustrate it from my perspective. I, uh, got to know one of Oxford's leading philosophers and he and I were on opposite sides in a debate and he seemed to, we, we enjoyed each other's company and he invited me to come and address his students on the existence of God in his college and he said, I hope you're going to use your best argument. So I said, well, I'm very happy to use my best argument against atheism if you tell me what it is. Oh, he said, it's, it's obvious what it is. The best argument against atheism is fine tuning. Mm -hmm. And if ever I was to become a believer in God, which I'm not, fine tuning would be the way. So that is the impression people get. So my attitude to it is, I suppose, at the level of the public understanding of science, because I cannot claim and wouldn't claim to be an expert in this area, but I watch what the experts say. And at the current stand of science, and that's all we can deal with, the evidence for such fine tuning is so powerful that they're falling over themselves to give an explanation. But here's where things get very interesting because their explanation is far less testable than the fine tuning is itself. If you reject God as an explanation, and he's a perfectly rational explanation for fine tuning, the precise fixing of the constants necessary for life. If you exclude God and go to a multiverse system, well, as Sir John Polkinghorne points out elsewhere, that these are speculations, they, these universes, if they exist, are not accessible and never will be. So what are you going to do? Choose between one universe created by an intelligent God or a multitude, an infinity, whatever that means, of parallel universes to which we've no access. And, and so what happens is this, that the evidence that you want to adduce to get rid of God to explain a given phenomenon now becomes a lot less, a lot more shaky than the evidence for the phenomenon within science itself. Mm. And so you've got to make a judgment. And my judgment of the literature I've read is there's very powerful evidence for fine tuning. I mean, some of it is very obvious, David, in the sense that here we are on planet Earth and we're rotating. If the Earth rotated a bit faster, we would not stay on it. And if it rotated slower, we would bake to death in the daytime and uh, die of, of, of cold at night. If the Earth was slightly nearer to the sun, similar things would happen slightly further away. And there are dozens of simple parameters that most ordinary people understand exactly like this. But then there are the fundamental constants. And when you get people like one of the cleverest mathematicians in the world, probably this century, um, in Oxford, who won the Nobel Prize uh, not uh, long ago, um, he in his calculations, Sir Roger Penrose, he said, and these are his words, not mine, the creator's aim to have a universe like this with the second law of thermodynamics, which means that even your Rolls Royce will rust. The creator's aim has to be true to one part in 10 to the power 10 to the 123. And he says, this is just unbelievable because that number is so big that it it is far greater than the number of elementary particles in the universe. In fact, you can't even write the number out by putting a zero on every elementary particle in the universe and putting a one in front of them. So this is an overwhelming evidence that there's something going on.
And I love Sir Fred Hoyle's reaction to the bit of fine tuning that he found in the resonance of carbon. Uh, how is carbon produced? Uh, and he predicted a resonance and it was found later. And he probably should have won the Nobel Prize in many people's opinion. And he said, nothing shook my atheism of like discovering this. And yet it was only a few, it was a few percent each way. Uh, these are not a few percent, they're billions of billions of billions of billions. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that there's something really interesting going on here. And we've got to distinguish between the scientific facts, the establishing of fine tuning, and what people deduce from it. Yeah. John, it's, it's fascinating. There's maybe, maybe time for just a couple of other um, little forays into things that you've picked up in your book. And one of the new sections in cosmic chemistry, which I'm very keen to, uh, to recommend to people, is a chapter towards the end of the book that you've written on systems biology. And in that, of course, there are several significant names, one of whom has been known to me for some time because of his prowess in, uh, in the electrical activity in the heart and his work on physiology for that a fellow called Dennis Noble. And it seems to me, here's another interesting thing, because uh, it seems as though here is a new paradigm for thinking about how life evolved and it appears to be not just the kind of old-fashioned uh, modern synthesis notion of random mutations and natural selection but there's clearly a whole raft of additional mechanisms natural genetic engineering horizontal gene transfer symbiogenesis all of this kind of stuff which adds a measure of added design it seems to me and complexity to the to the whole process and yet it seems and and one of my uh, correspondence from Italy was suggesting that I ask you this question. What do you make of the, the notion that, that someone can address all of that, recognize all this integration and balance and sophistication and evidence of design, and yet at the same time, just feel as if that design is not part of the process? How do they escape the teleology? I just don't know. I just don't know. Now, you mentioned Dennis Noble. And I have a great admiration and respect for him. And I, because I began to be interested, I thought something's going on here. I actually attended the systems biology seminars. He ran in Oxford for quite some time over a, a couple of years. And it was fascinating to hear someone questioning some of the established wisdom in biological science and turning it on his head. And I, I think you're absolutely right. What they've come across is, yes, DNA is complex, but uh, there are much more uh, complex things on top of that. There's epigenetics, there's the folding of the, the, the proteins and all of that contains uh, information. And what they've done is come to the conclusion that the whole system has to be considered. That is the whole cell. And they're wondering whether we got to treat not DNA as the fundamental thing, but the, the cell. And they've introduced something that is almost anathema in certain areas of biology. And that is the notion of top-down causation, because that raises the concept of what the top is. But if you think of the cell, then you end up with the famous chicken and egg problem. You can't get DNA without a cell. You can't get a cell without DNA and so on. And as I read what they've written, and uh, one of the most fascinating books that Dennis Noble has written, and he's written a great deal, is The Music of Life, where he uh, thinks of the number of genes they now think that the DNA has, human DNA, and he likens it to uh, the biggest pipe organ in the world that is something like 30,000 pipes and uh, says that the genes, uh, so to speak, are playing a tune. <laughs> but that raises the, the question as to who composed the tune. And it's there that Dennis, although I admire him greatly, seems to me to run out into weakness. The teleology is sitting in front of him. and. What I don't understand is why, and whether he thinks this or not, I'm not sure, but why many people like this think that if they take the next step and say this is evidence 
of an informational input at some level, that that somehow is an anti-scientific statement. That's what I do not understand. You know, I was, I'm on the Professors Forum, which is a group of people that meets uh, once a term for a dinner in Oxford, uh, and we ask all, all kinds of questions. And uh, one evening, uh, the subject announced was the concept of an intelligent designer behind the universe. And I thought I hadn't suggested it. So I thought this would be very interesting. And after a lot of wrangling and discussion about crypto creationism and a lot of irrelevancies like that, I put up my hand and I said this, I've got a question for you scientists. Most of them were. I said, suppose we got a black box and we're studying it. Is it scientifically legitimate to ask whether or not this box evidences the existence of a min an informational input or output? And they all said, of course it is. Well, I said, that's what we're talking about. Is the universe like that? No, we're not. I said, yes, we are. That's exactly what we're talking about. We're not talking about the identity of whatever mind it is that is behind the universe. Let's first establish the question that teleology, uh, purpose and mindfulness or a mental input or an intelligent informational input is not excludable by natural science. And they agreed with me. So there's a lot of emotion bound up with this that, that I don't quite understand. Yeah. John, just, just as we wind this up, you make a, an interesting point in, in the book where you postulate potentially that there were maybe several singularities. You talk about the origin of the universe, the origin of life, maybe the origin of human life, the origin of consciousness. And you actually quote Max Planck. And let me just read the quote where he said, I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard matter as derivative from consciousness. What do you think he meant by that? And actually, what's your view as to who or what may be responsible for all this teleology that we've been discussing? Well, the interesting question here is, materialistic or naturalistic philosophy assumes that mass energy is primary and mind is derivative. My worldview, the Christian worldview, assumes the exact opposite, that mind is primary, the mind of God, and mass energy is derivative. And I think what some of these scientists like Max Planck and the very famous Irish physicist John Bell are realizing that actually within human beings, there's evidence of something even more profoundly fundamental than the actual material out of which we're composed, even though uh, somehow uh, the consciousness resides within that material. Now, the difficulty is very clear, David. No one knows what consciousness is, and I'm not afraid of saying that because I've asked many people and asked them, we just don't know what it is. So to say it emerged is absurd. <laughs> <laughs> because if we don't know what it is, how, how could we say how it originated? Unless we begin to see that just as my mind can have an effect on the matter of, say, your body, if I give you some news that you need to go to the railway station, pick someone up, then that's information. It comes from me. It's a, it's a mental thing. But it, it moves your body to go to the railway station and pick them up. That human beings are a profound mystery uh, in themselves. And the claim that makes most sense to me is that human beings are made in the image of God. And God is revealed in scripture as non-material, but certainly conscience, conscious. And uh, often when people, scientists raise the question of the universe from nothing, I say we need to be very exact in what we say. Uh, 
the universe comes from nothing physical, but it doesn't come from nothing. It, it comes from God, who is not nothing. So to sum it up, you see, it seems to me that 20 centuries ago, a writer got it brilliantly right. And I think there are divine reasons for that. When he penned the following words, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. All things came to be through him. And without him, nothing came to be that came to be. I'm giving a fairly exact translation of the Greek because it's important. It's talking about existence. And it's saying in the beginning was the word. The word already was. The word is eternal. The word never came to be. The word was God. God never came to be. But the universe came to be. And the Greeks, and I take great interest in the thinking of the ancient Greeks, they were fascinated by these two concepts, the categories of things that never came to be, that were eternal, and the categories of things that came to be. And what John's Gospel in its initial statement is saying, that there is a God, an intelligent God, we use the word word for him, and he is the cause of everything that came to be coming to be. So if we believe, as scientists do, that the universe itself came to be, then the claim is that God, the word, is the source of that. So this is, as I put it in my book, a word-based universe. And I think that is a profoundly important concept. And we notice that what John is telling us is that word is primary and matter is derivative and that reverses the naturalistic and the materialistic uh, worldview but i know which one makes more sense to be as a scientist john fascinating we've been uh, on the go for just over an hour and and i think our listeners and viewers will recognize that we've been listening to what i might describe as an intellectually fulfilled theist and uh, it's been really good just to, to range over some of that material uh, with you uh, this evening. Let me, as we wind up tonight, just say a couple of things. Number one, thank you, John, very much for investing your time and effort and energy, not only into our discussion this evening, which I've thoroughly enjoyed, but also into producing the wealth of material that you have available. And let me just recommend Cosmic Chemistry. Again, that's John's latest book, but there's loads of other material visit his website, johnlennox.org. Um, if you want to pick up a recording of this, uh, or indeed any of our other webinars, you'll get it at C4ID, which is the Center for Intelligent Design website. And there, there are links on the homepage to our YouTube channel. And the final thing to say is that this is one of a series of, of events. And uh, our next event is going to be on the 21st of February. And we're looking forward to welcoming Dr. Jonathan Wells, who is uh, another well-known design proponent with some very interesting things to say. And we look forward to uh, welcoming him and hearing his lecture, uh, which in, in fact is going to be on the vertebrate eye. So that's something uh, to look forward to at the end of February. That will be coming out by email to those of you who've already registered. Uh, if you haven't registered, make sure you like and subscribe on our YouTube channel or register for the newsletter or for emails on our website. And we look forward to the next event. Uh, John, thanks very much once again. And we'll just bid everyone good night at this stage. And